Hi. Uh, appreciate your interest in this uh, video, and uh, <clears throat> for the first uh, 15 minutes, we're going to talk about how coil works, uh, coil shape, coil field shapes, and the uh, a quick review of the relationship between frequency, depth, and target size. Uh, after that, we're going to uh, visit uh, four different beaches and the first of which will be Oceanside. And when we go to Oceanside first, I want you to really notice the physical characteristics of the beach and how it's laid out because later in the video we're going to revisit after a, a couple of uh, storm passages and there'll be a big cut and you can notice how much sand has gone out from the cut area out into the uh, flat area on, the, on a very low tide. Uh, again, uh, I hope you enjoy this and uh, learn something and uh, we'll get right to it right now. These are the uh, subjects I want to talk about pretty soon. Uh, how a coil works, how does a coil work, coil types, concentric winding, double D winding, and a, a new pulse. Also uh, frequency effects. So, how does a coil work anyway? Well, <clears throat> if uh, this is, depicts the, uh, the Earth and the lines of magnetic, electromagnetic force around the Earth. Uh, in red, they depict the uh, north to south lines. And it's just like this. And any, any uh, mineral or uh, metal object also has these kinds of lines of force in it. <clears throat> if we go here and this depicts the surface of the earth and the north-south lines going across real even. Uh, <clears throat> this depicts a target, let's call it a coin, and uh, you can see the, the coins uh, field right there lying in the earth. Also, uh, notice how the Earth's lines of force are manipulated or contorted by the target's uh, field. <clears throat> this is a, uh, uh, a detector coil and the uh, field under that coil. Now, as we, <clears throat> as we move that coil across here, when the field hits this change, the, the field on this uh, metal detector is balanced to or neutralized with the uh, Earth's uh, field in that particular area. It's always different in every different area. So that's why these things are adjustable. So we uh, move this across there and the detector beeps when it hits a change in this field. Again, uh, here's the surface of the earth. Here's some rocks in the ground and some mineralized dirt in the ground. Notice how uh, the close earth lines of force are contorted by the lines of force of these objects in the ground or the ground itself. If we take, if we take this coin here, and put it right there. This coin has its own lines of force, like this. Now, this line here might be contorted a little bit up like this. <clears throat> you can see that it gets kind of busy in there, and uh, the contortions that are already there will make it much more difficult to detect this coin than it would to detect this coin in a clean environment. That's the effect on uh, mineralized ground or iron or uh, rocks or other targets on the targets we're looking for. They just make it a lot difficult, a lot more difficult. <coughs> if this is our nail, 
It also has a uh, feel just like a uh, <clears throat> just like anything else. If we uh, run our metal detector across uh, in this direction, we hit uh, all the changes and lines of force at the same time, and we get one blip. If we run the metal detector across in this direction, we hit uh, changes and lines of force twice, so we'll get a blip and then another blip. I'm going to demonstrate that here in uh, uh, just a few minutes. <clears throat> One very important thing if, uh, is to keep that uh, uh, metal detector coil level with the ground and within an inch. Uh, this shows you the typical coverage if, you're, if your coil is real close and level. You can see that the amount of uh, uh, coverage between here and here is uh, massive. And uh, <coughs> it just uh, illustrates how important it is to keep that uh, uh, coil level and within an inch. That uh, are normally are uh, currently popular. Um, first one, and by far the, the most uh, prolific, is the uh, concentric wound coil. Uh, this coil has uh, the windings in it are all circular. Like that. And the <clears throat> field around this thing, looking at it from the top, uh, shows uh, that it stretches out uh, all the way around. And I call this area where it reaches out the aura. <clears throat> now, if we look at this coil from the side, uh, this, these, these bumps on both ends describe the aura, but the sweet part of the coil, the one we use the most, is uh, an inverted cone below it. <clears throat> now, all electronic fields electromagnetic fields are equal and opposite. So uh, the dotted line depicts the other half of this field up above. We pass a coin through this field up here, we'll get a beep, just as though we did it down here. Now, <clears throat> uh, keep in mind with this field going up here, if your uh, wires from your detector are down here and wound up down here or slip and are moving around you might you might get a uh, an indentation they, they they form their own field and they you might get an indentation in this field which also gives you one down here so you want to wind your um, coil wires away from the coil as fast as possible, one or two to get them up there before you wind them tight. Keep them tight. Uh, wires, all they do is cause wear and noise. A number of years ago, I sold a lot of uh, nylon bolts. Uh, the, uh, the detectors at that time were coming from the factories with uh, brass bolts, which the manufacturer said uh, didn't matter. But in fact, what was going on was We had uh, the brass bolt right here holding the staff onto the coil. What it was doing was putting an indentation up here somewhere, and you'd get one down here somewhere. Well, I don't sell any more nylon bolts because they all come with nylon bolts anymore. So <clears throat> they wised up to that one. Probably because of the fact that uh, people were asking for nylon bolts more than uh, uh, anything else. <clears throat> this, this detect, this is a top view of a pulse coil. Um, the uh, current popular pulse is the uh, uh, White's uh, PI, and it has a hole in the center, so I put one there. <clears throat> it has an aura also. However, the aura 
is so shallow as to be useless. It basically just sticks straight out. It, it doesn't really detect any depth. The depth underneath the coil is shaped something like this. The pulse works on uh, broadband noise. It shoots uh, a lot of many different frequencies into the ground and uh, then uh, reads the effects from that. Uh, <clears throat> consequently, there are, it, uh, pulses do not have discrimination. Also, if you notice, the, the shape of this field goes in. So while you're sweeping, uh, if you want to get good coverage, you, you must overlap your uh, uh, coil sweeps by about half. The advantage of the pulse is <clears throat> two main advantages, a uh, little more depth, and uh, with all those frequencies shooting at 400 pulses per second or better, um, <clears throat> yeah, you get uh, a better reading in highly mineralized ground. It really cuts into the mineralized black sand beaches and so on real well. It's very good. <clears throat> the other, the other uh, coil that's out there uh, is uh, called a double D. And again, looking at it from the top, the windings are a, a double D facing each other. Mine Lab is the only uh, current major manufacturer that uses this coil uh, design. It's a little hotter. All the aftermarket coils are uh, double D windings. Uh, it is more expensive to manufacture. The, the aura from the top is shaped like this with a little bump on the end, and the field from the top is long and narrow. It's only one inch wide, and it goes from end to end. This is the side view. Uh, this is, you might think of this like a butcher's blade knife. This is only one inch thick. A couple of advantages. Uh, <clears throat> the coil shape goes straight down from the sides, and uh, compared to a concentric wound coil, you can see that you, you might be getting as much as 100% better coverage with each sweep. Um, <clears throat> there are many other factors, such as frequencies, that affect it, and uh, I go into that in uh, professional beach detecting, uh, another video. You might check that out. Uh, <clears throat> the narrowness of the, of the field uh, helps you separate targets real easy. If you, if you have a couple of targets, uh, better use the red, a couple of targets here, you're going to get, the only one of them is going to be in that field at the one time, and you're going to get real good distinct blips on each one. If if those targets were in the concentric coil, uh, you're going to get uh, one blip. You're going to get a combination of the two targets. You might get a raw whoop or uh, or uh, whatever. But when they're close together, you don't get the separation that you get with this. Uh, disadvantages with the uh, <coughs> with this coil compared to this, the double D and the concentric. The double D, like I said, is more expensive and it's very narrow. So uh, you must sweep it side to side to take advantage of that. Uh, you can't push it or, or wander around. You must do the a sweep. This graph uh, roughly depicts the uh, relationship between target size, depth, and frequency. Um, along the bottom is a uh, frequency from low to high. Uh, <clears throat> along this side is target depth, deeper up here, and size, bigger up here. If, if we have a, uh, a very low frequency metal detector, <coughs> it, uh, may not, it, it may not pick up a coin that, that size of target 
but it may pick up a tin can or even larger. And it will do it to pretty good depth. <coughs> if, if we slide this frequency all the way to high, um, we may pick up a small gold nugget, but we won't get it very deep. Um, the relationship is very interdependent, and it's uh, pretty much a straight sliding scale. Uh, most of your uh, manufacturers, of course, uh, pick something in the middle, a frequency in the middle, and uh, I go into that very extensively in professional uh, beach detecting, in my other video. Here's a uh, Here's a graphic description of how that works. You can see the nail on the piece of paper. I put it on there just to show it better. We're cutting across the straight lines now. We get one blip. If we go back the other way, you can hear both uh, ends, both poles, going through the field of the coil. This distance uh, is approximately eight inches and uh, will be the shallow coverage of your coil as you move it in an arc in front of you. Of course, again, the coil has to be level, parallel to the ground and within an inch to get the best coverage. Uh, this is an example at, uh, say, six inches deep. Maybe that's your coverage, the six inches deep. Uh, a couple inches at the most. You can see where I believe most of us, including myself most of the time, are moving too fast to get any kind of real, real coverage. Uh, when you say this guy missed the target, but I didn't, that was luck. Coil just happened to be over in the right spot, and his was very easy to do that. Uh, slow down. Uh, and your, the best way to do to make 100% uh, coverage is use a grid pattern. While, and while you're doing this, drag one foot or shuffle so that you can see your exact tracks in the sand. Uh, the other thing is, as far as spacing goes, you have to measure kind of eyeball what your arc is. Everybody's a little bit different. If your right hand, your arc to the right is a lot farther than your arc to the left. And you want to keep that in mind when you do your gridding. Uh, again, you want to go slow. can't find anything unless uh, we hunt the places where people have been. And in order to do that, we do want to check our crowd patterns. The best way to do that is uh, midsummer, go down there, hike your way in, and take a look at those beaches when they're really loaded up. You might be surprised at where uh, people congregate. Uh, a few tips that uh, help you without the luxury of being able to see right where they were. Uh, are the following. Uh, obviously, uh, entrances to the beach from parking lots and so on, uh, people don't want to go too far. Uh, also, uh, approaching these entrances, leaving the beach, they shuffle their towels around looking for their car keys or whatnot. They drop a lot of stuff right here. Good place to check. Uh, lifeguard stations. There's always a good crowd in front of them grid in front of a lifeguard station uh, down to the water. This is real good. Uh, patterns also, uh, mamas and little kids, they're never very far from the bathroom, I guarantee you. So uh, uh, the pathways to the bathrooms and the 
cover that traffic. Food stands, that creates traffic. People go back and forth by and through. <coughs> uh, Zuma Beach in uh, Los Angeles County, when that, that's a huge beach and very popular, and there are three places at that beach where there are park entrances, bathrooms, lifeguard stations, and food stands all in a close area. And those three places are very hot during the summer when the high crowd happens. And look for combinations of these. Always check the berms. Uh, many beaches with a sharp drop down to the water and the berm there, people sit there and drop things out of their pockets. <coughs> Quite often. Fire rings. Uh, these at night draw party crowds, people drink beer and drop a lot of stuff. Signs will give you a little indication. Malibu <coughs> has a sign that says surfing one way, swimming the other way. <coughs> so, uh, if you're planning on the surfing side, all you're going to get is people uh, surfing and so on. But the other side, where the swimmers are, uh, more, there will be more traffic in those sand areas than uh, on the surf. Oceanside, and I sit up real quick to uh, pick up this detectorist out there. He's got a Pulse PI, and his technique is pretty good. One thing you have to watch out for, uh, he's got a short handle scoop, which is good for while you're swinging. If you have a long handle scoop, when that thing swings around on the scoop side of your hand, wherever you're holding it, why it will interfere with the metal detector, but he's doing pretty good. When I arrived, he had just dug a coin. Let's see how he does here. Notice how low to the ground that coil is. Pretty good. If he had boots on or something though, he wouldn't have to worry about getting his feet wet. This oceanside sand is pretty heavily mineralized and uh, that pulse handles it pretty good. Must have been a ghost. We're on the pier at Oceanside on Sunday, the day after uh, rain and whatnot. I figured we might get some good crowds, and we are. I wanted to show you the crowd pattern. It's much more pronounced in the summer. And uh, water temperature right now is 62, so it's kind of cold. But we've still got plenty of people out there in the water. Notice that concentration of swimming swimmers there. flag. It's right behind that uh, uh, public works horse there. That means that there's a riptide out here and uh, you should watch your, be careful if you're uh, swimming in the water. Uh, I, go, I go into that pretty extensively in uh, professional beach detecting, uh, one of the other videos. You might check that out. Uh, we're actually uh, about two hours from a low tide, so the tide is pretty low right now. And he's walking where people were swimming this morning. Right now it's uh, about 2.30 in the afternoon. Notice that long handle? It's actually better for deeper stuff, but he may get out there if he starts picking up any targets. He, he, he may have come from the uh, riptide area, trying to uh, use that riptide to uh, get down to uh, a, a level that might be holding more targets. He's also
also not swinging that uh, machine very much. Just sort of dragging it around the surf. Out here is where the jewelry is really lost. You see that surf bounces those people around, the water's cold enough. Uh, rip jewelry right off of you, your fingers shrink, you're numb, and you never know it's gone until it's way too late. This is a side view of that berm area I was telling you about. Not too pronounced now, but people that don't have their bathing suits and stuff, they sit on that high area just prior, just uh, at the high tide line. Lose a lot of stuff messing around right there. Oceanside has done a real good job renovating this beach. Uh, there's picnic areas there, bathroom areas. Of course, the lifeguard stations parking right behind. All those things create pretty good traffic. They also hold several big uh, boogie board and surfing contests here during the summer. Those things really create the crowds. This is one of those signs I was telling you about where the swimmers uh, go on one side and the surfers on the other side. You might as well expend your energy on the uh, swim side. That's where the most crowd is. This is Ocean Beach and I just hopped out to get a shot of a Beach King uh, beach cleaning machine. These things get out here and they uh, do clean the top inch to two inches of sand. And they will get uh, just about everything in there, especially if the sand is, uh, it has to be uh, level and loose, not wet. This is uh, what the sand looks like after the machines have uh, been over it. Very smooth, very clean. If you get there and you see this sort of a scenario, move on. This is still Ocean Beach and we're standing on a pier and you can see the surfers out here. The surfing zone here is uh, pretty close to the pier. I'm gonna zoom around. It's, it's only 10.30 in the morning in, uh, in April, so there's not many people on the beach anyway, but I wanted to show you how empty the beach is in the surfing zone, and when you get past the surfing zone, which is that uh, lifeguard boat right there, and you start seeing people in the swimming zone on the beach already. It's uh, pretty close to a high tide, and um, that beach cleaning machine at, at, uh, before 10.30 was done cleaning the beach. So, and this is a Monday morning, and that's what you want to beat. You want to beat that beach cleaning machine in early Monday morning from uh, a heavy uh, weekend traffic period. I'd like to discuss uh, a little bit about uh, where to look and when. Uh, pretty important. <clears throat> in the summer, uh, this is actually the source of our targets. Uh, they, this is when they're the most vulnerable. Uh, they're the shallowest. They're just dropped on the dry sand or in the water. The water is real loose and comfortable. And, uh, and the, the targets more or less just sit there. So uh, in the summer, anytime on the dry sand or in the water, because that's when they're dropped, anytime. But if you want to concentrate your targets a little more, get out there on these popular beaches, heavy traffic beaches on a Sunday evening, and uh, for 
Monday evening if it's a four-day uh, holiday. But uh, be sure before the uh, <coughs> beach cleaners come in. You want to beat them in for sure. Uh, if you have to, go in on a su Saturday evening. Wet sand, anytime, low tide. Uh, when the tide is low, uh, that is when the uh, most wet sand is going to be uh, exposed. And uh, you'll have a, a low tide in the afternoon in, uh, in California in the summertime, but the minus tides will fall uh, 1 to 4 a.m. And that's when the tides are really the lowest and you can really get out there and walk where the swimmers have been. In the fall, uh, before any storms hit, uh, definitely the wet sand is the best. Uh, but the minus tides that fall in the afternoon during the daylight, and uh, <clears throat> that's my favorite time. Uh, you walk on the swimming areas, the um, uh, tides are, are very low, minus tides. There's no crowds, everybody's in school or at work, and the weather is nice. In the winter, uh, basically we want to uh, watch for cuts. And cuts are uh, created by uh, storms, storm-driven waves, and, uh, and especially during a high tide. If you get a funnel passage during a high tide, that's when the best cuts are going to be created. Uh, a cut is is this. Uh, this is the mean tide level, mean sea level. This is the beach surface. <clears throat> when the when the water gets a lot of energy, driven by a storm more than the usual amount, it will actually at a high tide. I actually get this effect here. This will be the new surface of the beach. All these targets in here are now scattered from here down to here. Or if this is the low tide level down to here. So now our targets are down here <coughs> and very shallow if you get if you get on it right away. and they're vulnerable. So uh, you want to hunt during the storm near a high tide, during the storm passage, down to a low tide. That's when these cuts are being created. That's when these targets are going to be loose. That's when they're going to be most vulnerable. However, uh, you don't want to get caught. If this is a four-foot wall and you've still got eight-foot waves coming in, you don't want to get caught in there be a little cautious. Uh, hunt from the high tide down to the low tide. And that's, uh, that's going to be possibly your biggest payoff. Sometimes you find a target and you wonder how in the heck it ever got there. Uh, I'd like to discuss some of the more obvious ways uh, the targets travel on the beach. Um, obviously, when a coin or a target is dropped, <coughs> it'll sometimes it'll usually hit the sand and disappear and be just barely below the surface. Of course, uh, when they're freshly dropped, again, they're the most vulnerable. But many times, uh, somebody sitting on a beach or laying on a beach or rolling over or whatever will dump a pocket full of coins. I call that a pocket dump. And you should, if you find one coin, you should always be aware that there may be more in the immediate vicinity. Uh, for instance, if a beach raking machine comes by, uh, it may string that coins out in a line sideways. So if you hit a coin or two, make sure you go both ways up and down the beach for a little bit. Make sure you check that area. Uh, the main way that the uh, coins or targets are moved are is when they are uh, 
cut out of a cut. Um, I just uh, explained a, a cut and so on, and you always search from the cut down towards the water. Uh, uh, coins or targets of like size and weight, uh, density, uh, tend to end up the same distance from a cut or same distance below it, uh, all in a line. So uh, be aware that when you find a dime or a quarter or something a certain distance from a cut, uh, be aware you're probably going to hit a few more, at least a few more, at, the, at that same distance. <clears throat> when the, a coin does reach the water, uh, the, the pounding waves, the waves pounding, uh, generally work that target down to a harder level. This could be anything from three inches deeper down to a couple feet. A uh, hard layer could be a uh, solid rock, could be gravel, just a uh, little more dense layer, could be uh, rocks, could be uh, seashells, crushed seashells, a gravel made up of uh, crushed seashells. These harder layers tend to stop or at the very least slow down the sinking of targets. <clears throat> These targets can also collect in pockets. Uh, within all these environments or trenches and uh, these things can be a bonanza. You want to look for those. Uh, another theory uh, is that when you have a, a body of sand of like material and it contains targets that that body of sand actually moves and when it does the targets move with it and they stay in a relatively same position within that body of sand, uh, <clears throat> then uh, it's a good possibility at some time or other this, that's going to break down and deposit targets. Um, hard to uh, uh, really analyze how some of these targets got there, but uh, maybe you have an idea. This is kind of a uh, chilly April day on the pier in Huntington Beach. But uh, the sun's out and there's a threat of rain the next day, so there's plenty of people here. You can see that uh, this, the volleyball nets and whatnot, that offers a good opportunity. A lot of people jumping around, losing some stuff there. And what I really wanted to show was a cut. This uh, is a couple days old but it's certainly worth a try. This shows the other side of the pier, and uh, you can hear some of that music in the background. There's some kite flying activity going on over there, and a food concession stand, and uh, parking right behind the beach. Of course, in the summer, this place is really loaded up. Always want to check in front of those lifeguard towers. Or right next to them. I worked this cut uh, for about 70 or 80 feet. And you can see my tracks going down along the edge. And then uh, I got two coins going that way. And if you see where my scoop is, I missed it on the way down. But on the way back, overlapping, I got lucky. I found a little piece of gold. I'm going to show you that in a minute here. Okay. This is uh, Teresa from Crestline. And she's agreed to uh, help me show off this little piece of gold I just found off this cut here. piece of black heeled gold. I'm going to go up and down this uh, below this cut a couple more times and we'll see what happens. But uh, I suspect some of the more, more of the targets are down the slope.
This is uh, this beach is Capistrano, and I'm here to show you the rocks. Uh, this beach normally has uh, about practically all rocks showing, but uh, what we're look but now uh, it obviously imported a lot of sand, and uh, there's just there's a rock show showing there. A pan around, and we'll see some rocks. Uh, Another place, here's some real small pebbles coming through. I'm showing you this because the uh, rocks tend to hold targets. And uh, it's a good idea to uh, get on the uh, higher side. Because everything that's been lost above will come down and get caught by these rocks. Uh, also, we're pretty close to low tide, so you see those rocks showing at the waterline? You want to show above those, too. Now, uh, down below, it's uh, pretty much solid rock, so it can get pretty tough digging, but I guarantee you everything that's lost is still right here. It hasn't gone very far. Beach in the background is Doheny State Beach with uh, Dana Point down there. This is Mission Beach without a tripod in the wind, but I was working this cut right here. And I haven't had much luck. I got uh, about 10 or 15 coins off of it. I worked about five lines parallel with it and then uh, did a couple of zigzags down there and uh, hit a dime and then I closed my, up my zigzags and then all I hit was nails. So there wasn't any uh, coin line lower. All the coins were uh, right up pretty high in the first three lines. One interesting thing right here was uh, this uh, track is from a beach cleaning machine and uh, he tried to come down and clean below the cut. First time I've seen that and uh, found the uh, sand was probably too soft. Standing on top of the cut now, the swing around, there's a fire ring, uh, not a bad thing to check around. Of course the volleyball, and we're looking at the uh, south end of uh, Mission Beach, the Mission Bay jetty down there. We're back at Oceanside. Uh, it's about a week later, August, excuse me, April 28th at 6.30 a.m. And it is now a uh, minus 1.5 low tide. And I have already been out there uh, with the knee boots on, right about out there, and uh, with no luck. Uh, uh, I hit a couple targets with a pulse that uh, I couldn't reach. Uh, the water wouldn't let me reach it. And where I was swimming was where those earlier people were all depicted when the weather was better, right at the end of uh, Mission Avenue, or uh, that street right down there. The reason I didn't uh, do, do too well, I'm pretty sure, is there's been a massive shift of sand here in the last week and a half. We've had uh, lots of weather. It was raining last night. It's supposed to clear up today, finally. You can see that uh, a very large cut there. And uh, <clears throat> that sand there from that cut 
has been moved out and covered all the targets that may have been lost by those swimmers we saw earlier. So I think my best bet now is to take a machine with a uh, discriminator and work that cut. Uh, there's lots of iron in there so uh, the pulse without the discrimination wouldn't be too good. It'd be a lot of work. This is a better angle on that cut. It's uh, really a pretty good cut. It's a couple of hundred yards long, maybe 150 yards long, and uh, four to five feet high on average. The interesting thing about that cut is the rocks that are just below it. Uh, anything that got released out of that cut is gonna find its way into those rocks and get caught like we discussed uh, before. So I think my best bet today is to hunt that cut and uh, with a discriminating metal detector. There's a lot of iron down there and uh, Forget all that stuff that the, those swimmers may have dropped. I'm sure that's covered up pretty good because of that, all this sand that's been moved out. This is a uh, Charrington cleaning machine. And they're not gonna have much luck out here. The sand is still pretty wet and she's working just above the cut. I was hearing stones plunking into the back of that thing. That's a collector right there. Today, getting a little bit of kelp, that's about it. Here's a little closer up to that cut. Pretty good size, and you can see the rocks coming out of the top and rocks showing down below it. By the way, these, a lot of these rocks are hot rocks very difficult in here. Uh, I, I just worked it for about 10 or 15 minutes. I only found one penny and lots of junk. Lots of hot rocks, like I said. In other words, uh, extraneous noise and so on. If this cut were here in uh, mid, late summer or in the fall, this would be a bonanza. But this, most of this sand has just been brought in before this series of sand. And that's going to cost the city of Oceanside quite a bit because they're going to have to re come now and replace this sand that they just lost. It's kind of a freak deal this last uh, week. But it's a nice looking cut. Uh, too bad it's off season. I was talking to the operator of one of these Charrington machines at Coronado, and he claimed he could get four inches deep with it. He probably could in real nice soft powdery sand, but today, uh, especially with a few rocks showing and whatnot, they're basically really just beating up that machine. You're better off going out picking up the kelp with a, with a hand rake. But I doubt these high paid city employees are going to do that. Uh, by the way, uh, another thing that's kind of interesting, uh, the state beaches uh, usually rent machines like this uh, once or twice a year or not very often from the county and city organizations. And the state, mainly for its cleanup, is manual and they use a lot of uh, drunk drivers and that sort of thing. 
So state beaches uh, have a lot more uh, uh, stuff, coins and chains and so on in the top few inches. Something to keep in mind if you're going to make a choice between a state beach and a city or county beach. See how deep that thing's going. Not a bad machine, actually. morning uh, at Oceanside was not very productive. Uh, after uh, I was working at uh, Cut the second time, uh, I ran into a man named Lee Larson. He uh, lives in Oceanside. He's a, a detector dealer there and works that beach every day. He really knows that beach. And uh, he told me some interesting things. Uh, when I first saw Lee, he was walking past the Cut, completely ignoring it, heading south and I was thinking well you never know when I was filming from the pier he was doing that uh, <clears throat> he told me that uh, the sand I knew it had been imported but the sand and rocks and whatnot had come from the uh, Oceanside Harbor the city uh, dredges the harbor and then pipes, the, the, the whatnot, the sand and rocks and whatnot, through a pipe down the beach to the, the main city beach, and they put it on any beach they want, uh, which is pretty slick. Uh, uh, they're not, uh, uh, that's about as cheap as you can do it, is uh, supply your own sand and then pump it. Uh, you're within a mile. Uh, the sand, the sand, uh, that cut had been created the last three days. Uh, there were two minus 1.7 uh, low tides with uh, six foot plus high tides the last three days. And today it was a minus 1.5, what we were looking at. But during the last three days, there were also two frontal passages. And uh, that was what created the cut. But uh, there wasn't much in the sand that had just been pumped there. And that's, that's why uh, I got junk, I got uh, bullets, a lot of uh, brass from uh, the Marines at Camp Pendleton. Uh, very poor. Lee had already paid his dues and knew that. Uh, he was working a, a seam a quarter mile south that uh, a portion of the beach had uh, wore away more than other parts of the beach that he'd found, and uh, he had a handful of coins out of there. Uh, he also, uh, when I just as I left, uh, started hitting quarters in pretty close to the pier, uh, inside of the cut. So uh, those were quarter, quarters that were washed down from that play area and so on. Uh, he did tell me that, uh, that the, the beach had been relatively unproductive the last month and a half made me feel a little better and the fact is that uh, spring is the poorest time of year. Uh, uh, it's, we're waiting for now for the fresh targets to be put down from the spring break, Memorial Day, 4th of July and so on. So this is the poorest time of the year. Uh, 